we're looking today at Psalm 19, as you have seen and are told. It's one of the most important psalms for Christian thinking and philosophy. So during the course of this study, you will hear about a whole range of questions like, what about those who have never heard the gospel? What about other religions? What about cross-cultural communication? What about ethical debates and some personal response? So firstly, let's turn to God speaks through creation in verses 1 to 6. Now, the great theme of the psalm is that of God revealing himself in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, while the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It's not a philosophical proof for the existence of God. It's not arguing everything has a cause, therefore there has to be a first cause. It's just saying that the creation around about us speaks of the creator. Continuously, verse 2, day to day pours out speech. And abundantly, it, it pours out the speech about God. And universally, for verses 3 and 4, there's no speech, there are no words where this is not heard, where creation and its message is not revealed. Uh, Psalm 8 speaks of, out of the mouths of babes and infants come the praises of God. Psalm 19, it's out of the creation, all around about us, speaks of the wonders of God. The sun is personified in verses 4 to 6 for us there, of striding like a man across the universe, across the sky. And so is seen by everybody, so is felt by everybody. Nothing is hidden from it. So the very creation yells out the glory of God. Now, in the New Testament, the evidence of God's creation is seen for example, in Romans 1.19 following, for there we're told that God has revealed himself plainly in creation. Picking up from verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. It's the same as our psalmist here. The very heavens, the very earth, the very stars, the sun, the moon, the grass, the mountains, the rivers, the, the snow, it all screams of a creator. It's not just that we can see God in the creation, but more, God chooses to be seen there. God has chosen to make himself known to humans there. And though we must remember that the passage in Romans is about the wrath of God on mankind who arrogantly have rejected God. Uh, we refuse what God has made plain to us and so turn to the foolishness of idols instead of the truth of God. And so within Romans 1, the great knowledge of God that is there in the heavens and made plain to us in our own selves, the great knowledge of God leaves us without excuse. I mean, that's the point of that passage. Psalm 19 is not quoted there in Romans chapter 1. It's only quoted once in the New Testament. The quote occurs in Romans chapter 10, where Paul is arguing that the Jews are accountable to God for ignoring his word. Romans chapter 10, for the same point is being made there as is made in Romans chapter 1. And to make the point in chapter 10, he quotes Psalm 19. That is, the Jews are accountable to God because God's message has gone out into all the world. You see it there in verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. See, how does faith come, he asks in Romans 10? Why, faith comes from hearing the word of Christ, verse 17. But how can people hear the word of God? Well, the answer is very simple. The word of God has been preached throughout the world in the creation, everywhere in creation, so that they are without 
excuse. However, our psalm back here on Psalm 19 moves beyond the creation's revelation of God and speaks of God speaking through the law. Pick it up, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It is the same God who speaks in creation. It is the same voice and the same words spoken that speaks now through the law of Israel. For the one who created the world created Israel as well. And the one who speaks through creation speaks through the law that he has given to the nation Israel. For what the psalm is talking of is the very word of God. Notice in this wonderful little passage where the poetry kind of comes through in English, doesn't it? It's almost impossible to, to read it without thinking of creating a song to sing it by. But notice in this little section of parallel poetry, the law is equated to the testimony, to the precepts, to the commandments, to the fear, to the rules. A law is most likely not the right word in English to translate it because law means to us rules and regulations alone. Whereas the word law is the word that refers to the whole first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the the way of life and the way to live, which includes not only rules and regulations and, and rules and declarations like the Ten Commandments, but it also contains narratives of the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Exodus and the plagues and Pharaoh. That's all in the law. For the law is about the instructions for life. The law is the very word of God. Now, in all the ethical debates that there are, there are three levels of discussions that take place. And all three are reflected in this little section in verses 7 to 9. The first is God's commandment, the word of God, the law of God, the declaration of God that sets absolute standards for life. If God says something, then that's the last word on it. If God says murder, theft, adultery is wrong, then they're wrong. If God says love, truth, faithfulness are right, then they're right. God is the, both the determiner and the revealer of right and wrong. However, only those who are the servants of God pay attention to the words of God. And our ethical debates go beyond just the community of Christians. And there is a second level of debate the first is what God says, but the second is intuition, ideals. As you can see, this is revealed in the psalm as well, in the way that the word of God is described in verses 7 to 9. For it is perfect, it is sure, it is right, it is pure, it is clean, and it's true. And those adjectives about the Word of God, those descriptors about the Word of God, they are an appeal to the very nature of things. This is an appeal to those judgments that are intuitive, derived from some kind of moral compass within ourselves, that we can hear it and say, that's right. I can't necessarily argue why it's right. I can't show you why it's right. It's not right because somebody said it's right. It's just I know that love, truth, faithfulness are right. I know that murder, adultery, stealing is wrong. Not because God says it, it's just that it's, it's right. It's intuition that I have. And yet there's a third level of moral, ethical debate. There's the pragmatics of ethics. How it works out in practice. The consequences that flow from it. Sometimes it's called utility or utilitarianism. It judges an action not by whether God says it's right or wrong, nor whether by the fact that we think and feel that that's a right or wrong thing. 
It judges an action by, well, what are the consequences? Will this lead to better things or will it lead to worse things? Uh, discussions in governments are often about outcomes rather than right or wrong. Uh, the favourite phrase of pragmatism and utilitarianism these days is harm minimisation. That we, we, we choose something which is, well, we know wrong, but we choose it because by choosing it we can minimise the harm that it does. So the government's not saying that drugs are good or that we want to encourage anybody to be abusing drugs or using drugs without prescriptions and medical advice, but needle distribution minimises harm. So it's better to distribute needles even if it implies and encourages illegal usage because it's better to have the drug addicts with less disease and with a lesser spread of disease. Now that's utilitarian ethics. Now here in verses 7 to 10, you'll notice the law is again described pragmatically or in pragmatic terms. Here are the positive outcomes of law and law keeping. For you find in verse 7, it's reviving the soul and it's making the wise simple. And in verse 8, it's rejoicing the heart and enlightening the eyes. And in verse 9, it's uh, enduring forever and righteous altogether. There are consequential views of the law. It's not just that it is in itself pure, right, true, but it also is enlightening and enabling and helping. The word of God comes not just with divine authority, that would, should be enough actually, the word of God comes not just with the intuitive rightnesses that the truth is being spoken, the word of God also comes with a positive practical outworking. It's the best way to live. So verse 10 summarises, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. It is to be more treasured than to sit in the square for half an hour and soak up some sunlight. For what you have here in God's word is of more value than that. It's kind of nice to be told you're doing the right thing for a change from the front, isn't it? And it's kind of nice for a preacher to be able to say to people, you're doing the right thing. But it's really important that I've got to tell you to do something, haven't I? So I'll say, keep going. Now, this is 11 to 14, gives us the third section. God's servant is warned. For the servant of God finds the warning of God in God's word. You see it there in verse 11, moreover, by them is your servant warned. Notice it is your servant that is being spoken of. Uh, it's a way of speaking about himself, the psalmist, but it's also about the way of anyone who is going to read and pay attention to this psalm should be spoken. For it's the person who stands opposed to God who characteristically will not listen to God's word, and it is the servant of God that will listen to the word of God. And it's, it's almost like a litmus test on genuine Christianity, because those who want to twist the word of God, change the word of God, ignore the word of God, downplay the word of God, have less of the word of God, are people who are not the servants of God. Whereas those who are the servants of God rejoice in hearing yet again more and even the old part again of the word of God. Your attitude to the word of God is generally indicative of your attitude to God. If you're a servant of God, you will love to hear his word. If you're an enemy of God, you will hate the idea even that the word of God is being printed, spoken of, or, or anything being done with it. And so you'll see the enemies of God's people will always attack us, calling us things like Bible bashers and fundamentalists, which are just rude terms, aren't they? They're not really saying anything about us, and yet they do say something about us. They hate us because we love the word of God. It's the characteristic of the servant of God that they will love the word of God. And therefore, it's no surprise that the ultimate servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
constantly turned to his father's word, always quoting the word of God, acting upon the word of God, framing his life and his service by the word of God. For all who would be servants of God must likewise gain their warnings and reward from hearkening to the word of God. This is so much of the message, not just of this psalm, but any of the psalms. Just turn back to the first psalm and the kind of topic sentence of the whole book of psalms. Verse 1 of chapter 1 of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, He meditates day and night. The godly, the servant of God, listens to the word of God, meditates on it, thinks about it, puts it into practice. For God's servant, back here to Psalm 19, verse 11, God's servant is warned by the word of God. Moreover, by them, verse 11, is your servant warned. And friends, We need this warning. For our sins are so often hidden and secret. Not just from the world. They're often hidden and secret from ourselves. You remember the old prophet Jeremiah who taught in chapter 17 of his book, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart, my heart, deceitful, not comprehensible, not understandable. And Paul taught the same about himself. He understood. So we read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, but with me it's very little thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me and who will bring the secrets of the heart out into the open on the last day. See, Paul didn't know anything against himself, but he knew enough of himself to know that that didn't mean he was innocent. I can stand and tell you I don't know anything about myself that would make me guilty at this very moment, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. And God's word stands like a torch shining into my heart. It stands like a like a mirror reflecting the true me. For my capacity and your capacity for self-deceit is enormous. Our rationalizations, our failed memories, our cover over of our excuses, the, the lies that we've told so often that we've forgotten that they were lies, we've come to believe them ourselves, our protection of our own self-esteem uh, before any negative evidence, our, our screening out of any un thinkable truths about ourselves. It's endless, our capacity for self-deceit. But the word of God makes plain what we are really like. So one of the chief functions of the law is to persuade us of our guilt before the gospel message of forgiveness and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the true mirror of the soul confronting us with the truth that we don't want to see. So verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. I have to deal with God who knows what even I don't know. And it's his word is the basis upon which I will be judged And it's his gracious word is the word by which I will be saved and forgiven and mercy extended to me. Our our sins are not just hidden and secret, needing the law of God to reveal them and the grace of God to pardon them, but they're also very often willful and presumptuous. Look at verse 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, Let them have no dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. In our sinfulness, we often fail to see how willful, how presumptuous we are. And that's the character of presumptuous sins, isn't it? You think you have the right when you don't. 
and the law shows me that I don't. So the psalmist finishes his thoughts with the prayer, not just for his psalm, but indeed for his words and all his words in life. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I can see here that there is not a person who grew up in the church in which I grew up because that is how the preacher I grew up finished every sermon, which meant that as soon as you heard that read, you stood up ready to sing the next hymn. You didn't, so I presume you didn't grow up in the church I grew up in. But it's a wonderful verse to finish every sermon with or to indeed to start every sermon with. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's a lovely little text, that one, isn't it? Now, at the beginning of this study, I warned that this psalm has enormous implications, so let me show you quickly five of them. Firstly, what about those who have never heard the gospel? Well, this psalm makes it clear they don't exist. See, it's a favourite dilemma that unbelievers like to put before us, and it genuinely worries some Christian conscience. What about those who have never heard the gospel? If we say they're going to be saved, then the best thing we should do is never preach the gospel to them because they're saved already, aren't they? Whereas we send missionaries over there, they hear the gospel, they reject it, and then they're lost. They were better off never to have a missionary. So that's a wonderful thing. Every, in fact, shut up about the gospel totally. If nobody ever hears the gospel, we're all saved. So the best thing to do is to stop speaking the word of God. That can't be the right answer. So we go to the other alternative and say, well, all those who haven't heard the gospel, they're damned. Well, that doesn't sound fair, doesn't sound just, doesn't sound right, does it? I mean, they never had a chance. I mean, I know ignorance of the law is no excuse, but that's because the law is public. These people, the law is not public for them. They didn't hear, they don't, can't hear. So it's not fair. But the scriptures say they don't exist. For the heavens declare the glory of God. All the world speaks of God. And so these people have not not heard the word of God. They have rejected the word that God has spoken to them. And so they are without excuse. For instead of worshipping God and thanking him for their creation, they have turned to my second heading, other religions. But you say, surely other religions are people seeking God and here's where God can speak to them and they are genuine expressions that would make people acceptable to God but if the revelation of God is clear in creation then these other religions are not seeking God they are the ways in which people run away from God this is the argument of Romans chapter 1. The eternal power and divine nature of God are seen in creation, but people reject the God of creation and rather they start to worship the creatures in idolatry. You see, our society has not replaced God with nothing. They have replaced God with nature or with materialism or with new age spirituality or of recent times with nationalism, because the most important thing that anybody can ever have in any life is to be an Australian. And unless you're willing to be an Australian first, well, you shouldn't come to this country. Whereas I was born in this country and I don't have Australia as first. I have the Lord Jesus Christ as first, not Australia. I don't live for Australia, I live for Jesus. If you don't like that, then kick me out of this country. But there are many of us who are here because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ first and foremost. And therefore it's no offence to me that someone else will come and live for Allah first and foremost. That is the character of where the country used to be, this new nationalism. You see, you reject God and you replace him with other gods. Even good things, like Australia, are false gods. Other societies, of course, replace God with statues. And, but either way, religion is not a search for God. It's the escape from him. It's the escape from him whom the heavens declare. Which brings me to the third implication. But what about cross-cultural communication? For this psalm speaks of the different speeches and words of the world, and yet it also speaks of the universal language of God in creation that is heard everywhere. There is no hiding from the warmth of the sun 
And while we have different cultures and different languages, yet we have the common experience of God in creation, and that he has made the universal communication possible. And so when the apostles want to reason with the pagans in Lystra, they appeal to the creation in Acts chapter 14. And when they want to appeal to the philosophers of Athens in Acts 17, they appeal to the creation. We shouldn't be worshipping idols because the creator is greater than the idols. The thing that crosses all cultures is the common creation that declares the glory of God and holds all humans accountable without excuse for our senseless idolatries. And fourthly, this psalm has implications for our society's ethical debate. For we're in the midst of massive ethical debates, friends, about cloning and euthanasia and embryonic stem cell research and the like. And this psalm shows us that the three levels of the debate, the word of God that the servants of God will hear, the intuitive sense of rightness and truth that reflects what the word of God says, and the practicality of living God's way by God's word because it will be the best way in the long run. Christians argue at all three levels because they all line up. Though, of course, not everybody will accept the first level. Finally, there's the personal response to this psalm. For it is God's servant who will take the warning of the word of God. The world doesn't. It rejects God and his word. The worldliness won't. It describes God's word as old-fashioned and restrictive and burdensome. But God's servant knows, verse 10, the value. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. The servant of God is greatly blessed by having God's word. 